You're listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B. L. Purdom. Episode 39, Love, Death, and Judgment. Last time, I examined the cards in the Tarot Major Arcana, whose symbolism can help to illuminate J.K. Rowling's narrative choices in Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. So if you missed episode 38, you should go back. This time, I'll look at the cards aligned with the sixth book of the series, so you may wish to refer to three earlier episodes about it. Episode 7, Fountain of Youth, about the ruling mythic archetype for Half-Blood Prince, and episodes 23 and 24, which focus on games, toys, and sweets in the sixth book. Anytime you want to listen or re-listen to any episode, just go to the Quantum Harry Twitter page, at QH Podcast, and click on the link in the pinned tweet to go to the Quantum Harry episode guide, which has links to all of the episodes in audio and video formats. There are also images of the tarot cards on the Quantum Harry blog, my Instagram account, the Quantum Harry Pinterest board, and the Quantum Harry Facebook group. And when the video version of this episode is posted on YouTube, you'll be able to see all of the images I'm talking about in the video. In the sixth Harry Potter book, love and relationships move to center stage. Harry and Ginny's relationship, foreshadowed by the lovers being a sequential card in the second book, and by the lovers card being linked to a sequential card in the previous book, finally blossoms in the sixth. But they are not the only lovers in this book. The column of major arcana cards aligning with book six has the lovers, number six, at the top, Death, number 13, in the middle, and Judgment, number 20, at the bottom. In the book with the most romance, it's fitting that the lover's card is prominent. A person torn between two partners is shown on many versions of the card, and we can see the torn person as more than one character. For instance, Ron's romantic choices are Lavender or Hermione. Hermione's are Ron or Cormac McLagan. Ginny's are Dean or Harry and Harry's are Ginny or Romilda. The lover's card doesn't just depict a choice between potential partners. The women on the card could be a mother and maiden, with a youth, the ruling mythic archetype for the book, as I talked about in episode 7, choosing between leaving childhood and dependence on a parental figure behind, moving to the next stage of life, when his mother will no longer be the central figure in his life, or staying with his family and postponing choosing a romantic partner. Faced with a choice of his mother on the one hand, representing his family, or Pansy, Draco chooses Narcissa, protecting her and his father. His mother doesn't want Draco to have to bear this burden, though, which is why she goes to Snape to ask him to take it from her son's shoulders. It would be easy to read about this and respond by saying, oh, but he's from a rotten family and he's being asked to murder to keep them safe. However, Dumbledore is sympathetic to Draco's plight. He wants to protect the entire family and offers his mercy to Draco, not to avoid his own death, since he's already asked Snape to kill him, but so Draco won't rip his soul by committing murder. Dumbledore doesn't fear death. He knows he's dying, and is attempting to control the manner of his death as much as possible. He fears Draco irrevocably damaging his soul more than his own demise. Harry has a choice that's similar to Draco's, his duty to the wizarding world, or romance with Ginny, which he calls blissful oblivion. After experiencing a little happiness with her, he decides he cannot turn his back on his duty, so he breaks up with her to protect both her and the rest of the Weasleys. The archetypal youth growing up and away from his family is a necessary, healthy development, but needs to be well-timed. First, he must fulfill his obligations. The youth on the lover's card is on the cusp of that very choice. The card linked to the lovers, number six, is the Devil, number 15, which is Voldemort's chief tarot archetype. This is the last sequential card for the fifth book and is at the bottom of the column aligned with the first. Voldemort is tied to both Harry's and Draco's choices. Everything they consider must take into account what he has done and might do. Death, 
Card number 13, in the middle of the sixth column, is also at the center of the sixth book. Voldemort has ripped his soul repeatedly, creating horcruxes through murder, so that he can use them to hold fragments of his soul. In the memories in Dumbledore's Poncive, Harry sees one victim after another, not realizing that Dumbledore is also slowly dying because of the cursed ring that is both a horcrux and a hallow. Ironically, a stone that brings back the shades of loved ones to an undead existence is killing the headmaster. Dumbledore wields the Elder Wand, another hallow, and it's possible that this is the reason that he wants Snape to kill him. Since Snape would be doing Dumbledore's will, Dumbledore wouldn't be defeated by Snape, and therefore the true master of the Elder Wand will be dead, and the wand without a master. Snape grows more and more reluctant to perform this duty, though it's a mercy killing for someone already slowly dying. This is also the only way, short of Dumbledore killing himself, for the wand to be without a master upon his death. More importantly, it's the only way to keep Voldemort from becoming master of the Elder Wand, since he would be defeating Dumbledore if Albus were to die from the Cursed Ring. Voldemort would then be master of the Elder Wand. In terms of tarot archetypes, both Snape and Voldemort embody the archetype of death, the one who cuts the thread of life, in addition to their other tarot archetypes, but Snape does so reluctantly. The cards linked to death, number 13, are the Emperor, number 4, because 1 plus 3 equals 4, and the Fool, number 22, because 2 plus 2 equals 4. As with Cedric in the fourth book, Harry plays the Fool to Dumbledore's Emperor, obeying his orders without question in private lessons, but especially when they go to the cave to seek the Locket Horcrux. But also like Harry and Cedric, Harry and Dumbledore trade places. Dumbledore becomes the faithful retainer to Harry's emperor, preparing him to take his place after he's gone. This swap doesn't take place once. Harry and Dumbledore go back and forth in these roles throughout the book. Dumbledore has embodied both the mythic archetype of the wise old man and the tarot archetype of the magician. But although he's frequently thought to have foolish ideas and loves jokes, toys, sweets, games, and fairy tales, Dumbledore hasn't embodied the fool before. He takes Harry, again playing the Emperor, as he did after Cedric's death, to visit Slughorn, the potions master before Snape, to ask him to resume this position while Snape becomes the defense against the Dark Arts teacher in Harry's sixth year. A fool isn't always utterly foolish. Sometimes he's, quote, like a Zen master who clarifies with riddles and cuts through misconceptions with ease, as Robert M. Place says in his book, The Tarot, History, Symbolism, and Divination. This aptly describes Dumbledore seeing through Slughorn's deception at the beginning of Half-Blood Prince, and again when he and Harry penetrate the defenses at the cave where they seek the Locket Horcrux. Harry as the fool who sees through artifice to aid his emperor is a theme running throughout the book, and because Dumbledore is slowly dying the entire time, it's fitting that the fool is linked to both the emperor and the death cards. It's also fitting that Harry, in the role of the loyal fool, follows Dumbledore's orders to the letter, and, like the fool in King Lear, he witnesses his sovereign's fall. Afterward, he's heir to the task of bringing down Voldemort, the mission for which Dumbledore has been training him. The Judgment card, number 20, at the bottom of the sixth column, is about making decisions, choosing a path, as the youth must choose between a birth family or future family. On this card, an angel blows a trumpet, calling the dead to rise. In the cave that formerly held the locket horcrux, the dead rise horrifyingly, and Dumbledore and Harry must fight in fairy, grasping at them from the churning water. The judgment card is also about finding a true calling, as Harry does by the book's end, but it's about letting the past go as well, which he does after seeing the past in the Poncive and learning from it. The cards linked to Judgment, number 20, are the High Priestess, number 2, because 2 plus 0 equals 2, and Strength, number 11, because 1 plus 1 equals 2. Ginny, who embodies both the archetypal maiden and the archetypal High Priestess, is a huge strength for Harry, quote, his best source of comfort, and is the choice he must set aside now. Instead, he chooses a quest, 
another sort of game that dumbledore has bequeathed to him before he can be concerned with romance and his future the sequential cards for the sixth book are the tower number sixteen the star number seventeen and the moon number eighteen which have also influenced previous books here the tower in question is above ground not inverted underground as the chamber of secrets was in the second book and the entrance to the shrieking shack was in the third as i talked about in episodes thirty three and thirty five draco confronts dumbledore on a tower and disarms the headmaster becoming master of the elder wand however snape embodying both the archetype of the crone as i talked about in episode six and the archetype of death the center column card for this book is the one who kills dumbledore who falls from the tower like the figures on the lightning struck tower card a common name for the sixteenth card of the tarot major arcana and the title of the twenty seventh chapter of harry potter and the half-blood prince this is the name professor trelawney gives this card when she rants about it turning up in her readings repeatedly presumably upright and not inverted which points to doom and gloom and which is probably why she goes through so many bottles of sherry in half-blood prince it can't be easy to believe that you are seeing a future that is so very gloomy and feeling like you can't do anything about it it will come regardless of whether you tell people about it or not j k rowling did not choose to include tarot in the curriculum trelawney taught to harry in his third fourth and fifth years but she evidently could not resist pointing very clearly to her own personal game of tarot with the title of this particular chapter though the tower as a symbol seems self-evidently to refer to the tower from which dumbledore falls it can also symbolize hogwarts as an institution since hogwarts is under attack from death eaters at the end of the book because of that it can also symbolize dumbledore himself a god figure an axis mundi a link between worlds just as trelawney teaching divination in her tower is a symbol of her being a link between worlds in a slightly different way since she is an archetypal crone who sees what others cannot as i talk about in episode six a murder of crones so yes dumbledore embodies a god figure but in the sixth book it's a specific god odin the all-father of norse mythology in which gods can die in chamber of secrets harry echoes the actions of thor norse god of thunder simultaneously slaying a supernatural serpent and being poisoned by its venom which i talk about in episode thirteen dumbledore's death in half-blood prince is nothing less than j k rowling's goethe dameron the twilight of the gods the original story also involves a cursed ring while Dumbledore speaks to Draco on the tower, Harry sees him grow weaker and weaker, either from the potion he drank in the cave, or that and Dumbledore having been dying all year from the cursed ring, whose deadly effect Snape only manages to slow down, not halt altogether. Goethe Dämmerung is German for Ragnarok. In this story, Thor kills and is killed by the world serpent, but Odin is swallowed by the great wolf called Fenrir. Rowling doesn't have her werewolf, Fenrir Greyback, kill Dumbledore, but it seems uncoincidental that she includes this exchange when Death Eaters join Draco on the tower. Is that you, Fenrir? asked Dumbledore. That's right, rasped the other. Pleased to see me, Dumbledore. No, I cannot say that I am. Greyback also suggests that he will physically attack the headmaster saying i could do you for afters dumbledore and when draco hesitates to kill dumbledore as death eaters egg him on fenrir volunteers to do it snape finally arrives dumbledore pleads with him a clear request to kill him as dumbledore already asked him to but now it also seems like a plea to save him from greyback's brutality Though as a master of death he's chosen the time of his dying, he seems to dread repeating Odin's death too precisely. The tower card also symbolizes old false beliefs falling apart, suddenly and violently, so the protagonist of the tarot story can build afresh on truth. A prominent role in this book for an upright tower card, rather than an inverted one, implies that we cannot expect the inverted meaning, a bad situation ending well. 
Dumbledore's death means that there's no way Harry can consider this to be a happy ending, which is clearly why Trelawney is alarmed by the card turning up repeatedly in her readings. A new unknown world is the result of pushing past the upheaval of the lightning-struck tower. The card linked to the tower, number 16, is the chariot, number 7, a fitting card for Harry's travels with Dumbledore, since the chariot is the tarot equivalent of the archetypal liminal being, the focus of episodes 8 and 9, and which I'll be talking about again in the next episode. When Harry and Dumbledore are together, the young, metaphorically queer liminal hero is with the old, not just metaphorically queer liminal hero, two Axis Mundis, links between worlds, who will both, during their lives, conquer a Dark Lord. In the third book, when it was the first sequential card, the chariot was about travel and transportation. Harry learns to apparate in the sixth book the final type of magical travel he experiences. This foreshadows the chariot being at the top of the column for the next book, which is ruled by this card, a book in which travel is an almost constant activity for Harry, the liminal being embodying the chariot card, who spends the book journeying home to Hogwarts. The star, number 17, follows the tower and points to Harry needing to find his path, follow his star, find his true calling. This is more likely now that the metaphorical Tower of Lies is gone. The star card shows a young woman with vessels of liquid that she pours evenly on land and into a body of water, and potions, poisons, and other liquids, such as the Poncive, play a key role in this book. Someone Harry's never met also embodies the star, Sirius's brother Regulus Arcturus Black. Like Sirius, which is the name of the dog star, Regulus is named for a star, one that happens to be in the constellation of Leo the Lion. So while Sirius is a Gryffindor with a Slytherin background, Regulus may be a Slytherin with the heart of a Gryffindor. Regulus has stolen the lock at Horcrux before Harry and Dumbledore get to it, though J.K. Rowling doesn't reveal this until the next book. Like Harry, Regulus was seeker on his house team, but though he catches the locket snitch and is a Slytherin, he cannot say open in Parseltongue and destroy it, just as only Harry can speak the magic words to the snitch from his first match to open that and receive the resurrection stone before going to his death. The card linked to the star, number 17, the second sequential card for Half-Blood Prince, is Justice, number 8, an issue that arises repeatedly in the Ponceve memories Dumbledore shows to Harry. This was also true when Harry entered Dumbledore's Ponceve in the fourth book. All of the memories Harry witnessed then took place in courtrooms in the Ministry of Magic. Voldemort, of course, commits many crimes to make horcruxes, but this card doesn't only point to justice in terms of comeuppance for Voldemort, delivered by Harry as justice. Dumbledore, for instance, seems to feel that it's just that he's slowly dying after he puts on the ring with the Resurrection Stone, since he yielded to temptation. In a similar vein, Harry is appalled by the result of his cursing Draco in the bathroom, and this is someone he's hated for years and believes is working for his mortal enemy. In spite of this, Harry accepts the justice meted out by Snape, a long series of detentions. Voldemort, in contrast, not only doesn't feel that he's escaping justice, but that his actions are justified by his goal, everlasting life. He also believes it's just for him to expel all Muggleborns from the Wizarding World and anyone who sympathizes with them. You might say Voldemort still has daddy issues. Dumbledore and Harry recognize that they are in the wrong, though Harry doesn't give the potions book to Snape, instead hiding it in the junk room of requirement, where he eventually remembers seeing Ravenclaw's diadem in the seventh book. So when you look at it that way, it's a flaw of Harry's that helps to bring about Voldemort's defeat. The landscape Harry and Dumbledore encounter on their way to the cave could come straight from the third sequential card, the moon, number 18, with dark waters separating them from their goal. The moon, wolf, and dog on this card can also point to Fenrir Greyback, the werewolf who bit Remus and who bites Bill Weasley when the moon is not full, fortunately, making him a pseudo-wolfman, in other words, kind of like a dog. 
The moon's reflectiveness also links to the watery poncive with its many memories. The card linked to the moon, number 18, is the Hermit, recalling Harry and Dumbledore leaving the school, a place of scholarly pursuit, and going out into the world, like the wandering hermit on the card. The Hermit is one of the depictions of a holy man in the Major Arcana, which both Harry and Dumbledore have been since Book One. Dumbledore, the old hermit, trains his heir to hunt horcruxes, making Voldemort vulnerable to death. It's an esoteric education conducted in secret on a soon-to-be lightning-struck tower under a merciless moon, with death and Death Eaters poised to strike at any moment. As with the first two books, there are again only two alignments that will occupy the final portion of this episode, the Horcrux aligned with the sixth book in the series, and the defense against the Dark Arts teacher for this book. I believe that the most appropriate Horcrux to associate with the sixth book is one of two that Voldemort made from living beings, the snake Nagini. Paired with Nagini as the other alignment is the defense against the Dark Arts teacher in Harry's sixth year, Severus Snape, head of Slytherin House, whose symbol is a snake. Harry's ability to speak Parseltongue re-enters the plot in Half-Blood Prince. He understands the snake language spoken in the Gaunt House in the Ponceve memory that introduces Voldemort's family to Harry, including Voldemort's mother. When Harry first sees their house, a dead snake hangs on the door like a really creepy talisman that the Gaunts no doubt hope will ward off potential visitors. The Lover's card, number 6, linked numerically to the Devil, number 15, can link to both Nagini and Snape. She's a symbolic mother to Voldemort, her venom serving as mother's milk to nourish him before he regains his body. Voldemort obviously feels more connected to his mother's heritage than to his father's, and it's through her family that he can speak to snakes. Plus, on some versions of the lover's card, there isn't a youth choosing between two women, but Adam and Eve, with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, around which a snake is entwined, representing the serpent form that Satan chose to speak to Eve, convincing her to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge, which led to the fall in the Genesis story, and again brings us back to Voldemort and the archetype of the devil, card number 15. Severus Snape, on the other hand, seems to be using a tarot deck with a lover card showing the youth and two women. In his life choices, he opts for the younger woman, Lily Potter, the reason he faithfully serves Dumbledore and spies on Voldemort. However, Snape's mother is also important, since she's where the title Snape creates for himself comes from the Half-Blood Prince, based on her maiden name being Prince and Snape's father being a muggle, which makes Snape a half-blood, like Voldemort. Also, when Hermione discovers Eileen Prince in an old library book without knowing that she's Snape's mother, the reason Eileen Prince is in the book is her membership in the Gobstones Club, a club dedicated to a game, bringing us back once again to the central theme of the series. The death card, number 13, is at the center of the sixth column of cards, and Nagini is how Voldemort kills Snape. Thus, both Snape and Voldemort are linked to at least one mother figure seen on the lover's card, number 6, the version with a youth and two women. Snape kills Dumbledore at the top of the lightning-struck tower, card number 16, the first sequential card for this book. As a Slytherin, we could say Snape was channeling Nagini, the real, not metaphorical serpent, who eventually kills him. The one Snape kills, Dumbledore, has been his guiding star, card number 17, the second sequential card for this book. On this card, a woman pours liquids onto land and into a body of water, treating them equally, sending a message about balance and duality. This could be another reference to Snape's proficiency with potions, but perhaps also a reference to his dual life, in which he pretends to be a loyal Death Eater while working as a spy for the Order of the Phoenix. Nagini has another link to potions. In ancient Greek, the same word is used for potion and poison, and Nagini's venom seems to share this dual nature. To most people, her venom is fatal, 
But while Voldemort is on the path back to having a corporeal body, it's the equivalent of a balm for him, of mother's milk. Finally, while he's dying in Deathly Hallows, Snape gives Harry memories, which are linked to the moon, the last sequential card for the sixth book. Harry views these memories in Dumbledore's Ponceve, a body of liquid from which one can see bodies rising, like those on the Judgment card, number 20, at the bottom of the sixth column. This means that Snape and the snake that kills him, a living being made into a horcrux, like Harry, both connect to all of the column cards and to all of the sequential cards aligned with this book. The relationship between these cards, this book's horcrux, and the DIDA teacher makes it even easier to see why Snape's death occurred the way that it did, though it was entirely wrong-headed for Voldemort to think killing Snape was the only way for him to become master of the Elder Wand, as I talked about in episode 25, The Wand Game. J.K. Rowling could have written a D.A.D.A. teacher in the first book who wasn't pursuing the Philosopher's Stone, which was protected by the Mirror of Erised, a doppelganger for the Ring with the Resurrection Stone, the Horcrux for Book One. In the second book, she could have had a D.A.D.A. teacher who did something prior to working at Hogwarts other than write books, the Horcrux for Chamber Secrets being a book. She could have had a DADA teacher in the third book who was not connected to the dictatorial round of time represented by the starry diadem on the Empress card, a diadem like that book's Horcrux. There could have been a DADA teacher in the fourth book who was not convicted of committing a crime with the family whose bank vault hid Hufflepuff's cup, that book's Horcrux. And Rowling could have had the Slytherin Locket, the Horcrux for the fifth book, end up anywhere in the world other than with the fifth book's DADA teacher, Dolores Umbridge. Likewise, Rowling could have had Voldemort use the killing curse, or poison, or any number of murder methods, such as setting Grey back on Snape. But no, he chose Nagini, the Horcrux aligned with the book in which Snape is the title character other than Harry and the defense against the Dark Arts teacher, connecting him, as Rowling does with the other DADA teachers, with the Horcrux for the book in which he holds that position, continuing her game and simultaneously linking it to an elaborate tarot game. You've been listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B. L. Purdom. All music heard on Quantum Harry is composed and performed by B. L. Purdom. Whether you are streaming on iTunes, Stitcher, Castbox, or another podcatcher, please leave a rating and or a comment and share episodes of Quantum Harry with your friends. Next time on Quantum Harry, episode 40, The Tarot Hallows, an extra long episode about tarot symbolism in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, including the epilogue, which will be addressed in the podcast version of the epilogue to Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse. I hope you'll join me. Oh.